Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for the fourth episode of the GigaChad Book Club. Before we get started, I have a few announcements to make. First, I'd like to apologize for the delay on this video. September was a busy month for me, and I celebrated both the Amazon release of one of my short stories, as well as the release of my new web serial, Tales from the Martian Principit, which you can read for free on my website at www.cavalentine.com. I'll have a link in the description. The series will have new installments posted bi-weekly, the fourth episode of which will be coming next Friday, November 4th, so I hope you look forward to it. Now, with that out of the way, let's start with the topic of today's video, Bochan by Natsume Soseki. Let's turn back the clock to 1906, the year that Bochan was published. The Empire of Japan under the Meiji Emperor is flying high having just secured a major military victory over the Russians one year prior. As the first modernized Asian country to fight and defeat a European rival, Japan now occupies a position on the world stage that no other country in the region has. The sun has risen in the east, and if you're living in Japan in this era, life is good. It's difficult to believe that just 50 years prior, Japan was still an isolated, feudalistic society that rarely ventured out of its home islands. In a single generation, Japan had moved from a nation of muskets and horses to a nation of battleships and artillery. Railroad tracks now stretched from east to west, connecting the once petty prefectures into a unified Japan. The end of the samurai and the rise of the oligarchic zaibatsu had brought immense wealth to the country, the result of which helped build much of modern Japan. Indeed, it is impossible for me to overstate the meteoric rise of the Japanese Empire from a regional backwater to a major global military and economic player, a change that all occurred in less than half a century. It was during this most tumultuous era that Natsume Soseki took the stage, and through his many works he would become known as Japan's greatest writer. Soseki was born the fifth child in his family. Unwanted by his parents, he was adopted by a childless couple who raised him up until their divorce when Soseki was nine. Although welcomed back by his mother, it appears that he never was able to develop a meaningful relationship with his father and was often seen as a nuisance. Soseki studied English in college, and after graduating, he took a teaching position in Matsuyama on the island of Shikoku, an experience that would become the basis of our novel of the day. Perhaps the most important moment of his life came in 1901, when he moved to the UK at the behest of the Japanese government to become a literary scholar. It was a rare opportunity for anyone at that age to be able to live and study abroad, but Soseki found the experience torturous. On the topic of living in the West, Soseki would later be quoted as saying, The two years I spent in London were the most unpleasant years of my life. Among English gentlemen, I lived in misery, like a poor dog that had strayed among a pack of wolves. While there is much and much more that could be said of Soseki's life, I'll leave the summary here. Like other authors of literary fiction, Soseki's beliefs can be gleaned through his writing, and everything you need to know about the values of the man can be found within the pages of Bochan. If you've been following our series since the beginning, you'll know that I purposefully saved Bochan for last, despite covering the other novels in chronological order. You might be thinking I did this to save the best for last, but really, I did it because I wanted to end this first phase of the book club on a high note. Dazai, Mishima, and to a lesser extent Murakami, all dealt with men in crisis. In Dazai, we saw the depravities of vice, cowardice, and arrogance. In Mishima, we saw the dangers of fanaticism and sexual debauchery, and an unrepentant sadism. Finally, in Murakami we saw life without purpose, loneliness, but ultimately a strength that follows through truth and action. In Bochan, all of this is stripped away. Our titular main character is, for lack of a better word, an oaf, 
He is not particularly intelligent or quick-witted. He is quick to judge and quicker to anger. He detests the country folk with whom he is forced to live, and they detest him in turn. And yet, one can't help but come to love Bo Chan. As hot-headed as he is, ultimately, he is a moral man. He is not led by the nose by money or status. He disdains vice and is able to see through the duplicity of others. He is not content to sit around either, but takes decisive action where others are too afraid to do so. It's important to remember that, although he was very critical of Japanese who parroted Western matters and customs, he was equally critical of Japanese who remained in the backwater. One telltale sign of the scorn he had for the people of Shikoku was his insistence on using the namoshi at the end of almost every sentence where a local person is speaking to him. He doesn't have to do this. He doesn't have to let the reader know that the person talking is ending everything with namoshi, but he does it anyway because it grates on him, and he wants it to grate on us as well. So what's the premise of Bochan? We get a brief window into the early life of our main character before the main story begins. Bochan, having just finished his three-year studies of physics, accepts his first job offer teaching at a middle school in Matsuyama. While the location is far from ideal, the salary isn't bad, and he figures that if things go south, he can always return to Tokyo. Bochan soon finds himself getting into trouble with both his students and the other staff members butting heads with nearly every single person he comes across. His disdain for his fellow teachers and staff is shown through the nicknames that he gives them. In fact, Bochan seems to constantly want to separate himself from those around him. The central conflict, however, soon shifts to a love triangle involving two of his co-workers, Redshirt and Squash, who are both in love with a woman they call the Madonna. Initially, Bochan is unsure what to make of this dilemma. He dislikes Redshirt, as he sees him for the effeminate snake that he is. But he is also not very fond of Squash, who barely makes any effort to communicate with others. Eventually, he comes to understand that Squash has the moral high ground in this dispute, and after refusing to play the part of one of Redshirt's pawns, he quickly becomes the target of a local scandal that would see him fired. But Bochan is not a smooth talker, nor is he particularly intelligent. In the end, he settles the issue the only way he knows how to, with his fists, pummeling both Redshirt and his lackey hanger-on into submission before turning in his resignation and abandoning his job only months after starting. There is, of course, much that I am leaving out. As always, I encourage the listener to read the full story and make up their own minds. This is especially true with Bochan, where on the surface, it almost seems like Soseki is offering up the solution that, yes, in fact, sometimes violence is the best answer. It's sometimes refreshing to read once in a while, especially as we live in an era that strongly discourages any form of physical altercation. Ever since I was young... There was a growing belief that if you are getting bullied, for example, you should just walk away. Tell the teacher, tell your parents, let someone else handle it. It's the exact opposite strategy that Bochan takes. Sometimes you might be confronted with an evil that is both more intelligent, wealthier, and more influential than yourself. And while there's something to be said for someone who tries to weave their way through social circles and court etiquette to their own advantage... There is something of a moral bankruptcy that comes with that duplicitous lifestyle. Of course, there's an argument to be made that nothing is solved by the end of the story. Squash is transferred out to Kyushu. Redshirt remains in his position of power. Porcupine and Bochan return to Tokyo. The status quo remains intact. But I think that's also the heart of the philosophy at play here. A moral person acts in the moment, regardless of how the status quo will or will not be affected. No one can know the long-term consequences of their actions. If one only acts when change or victory is assured, 
then one surely will live a life bereft of taking any action at all. It's an approach that some might find silly or even downright offensive, but think of how different things might have been for the main characters of the other books we've looked at, if they were simply more Bochan-esque. Character philosophy aside, Bochan is an excellent book, and is one of the classics that has stood the test of time. Soseki's ability to wield dialogue and craft characters that are both multifaceted and entertaining is truly incredible, and I would recommend everyone interested to pick up his other works as well. Thank you for joining me on today's episode. I have been debating whether or not to keep going with strictly Japanese literature here, or to expand to other books, or even movies and some games. If there's something you'd like me to talk about, please leave a comment below, and as always, keep reading.